Judges chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. So uh, last week read these verses and, and spoke about it just a little bit. Uh, but I want to talk about fear this morning. And again, I, I've preached about fear at different times, but not the kind of fear uh, that I've preached about before, such as being afraid of, of, you know, like the virus or something. I'm talking about fear to work for God, fear to allow God to have control of your life, uh, fear to have, let God have control of our church, uh, fear to have, let God have control of our, our families, uh, and to learn to submit to him. Uh, because I feel like that there's a, you know, there's a lot of fear that people have that prevents them from being able uh, to do great things for God. And uh, so we want to talk about that this morning. I, I just know this, that God is, and, and I'm going to mention this here in just a little bit, but God is able to use people just like us uh, to do miraculous and supernatural things. And uh, he is not limited to my inabilities uh, to get things done. So uh, I, I just, I need to learn to trust. Uh, we need to learn to trust and to walk forward with God and allow God to do with us what he wants to do uh, and just believe uh, that he is able to do it. So anyway, let's look here at chapter 7, Judges chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me. To give, to, the Midi to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead, and there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And uh, so uh, I want to I want to talk about the people who are uh, afraid and what causes fear. Now I, again, there's different types of fear, I suppose. But uh, you know, there's people that are afraid of of dying. There's people are afraid of getting hurt. There's people what you know that kind of fear. And then again, I think in 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 church, there's a fear of allowing God uh, to have control. And I've been talking about. Uh, you know, a subject of, of church welfare that, uh, you know, people that, that misuse church for their spiritual welfare and they, they depend on the church organization itself, uh, you know, to support their spiritual life. I don't know if that's the right way of putting it, but uh, what I'm saying is, is like this, and, and again, I've explained it every week so far, uh, but I, I want you to understand that coming to church does not make me a Christian. Uh, coming to church does not make me right with God. It is an essential part of my life as a Christian, uh, but I'm not dependent on it for my right standing with God. I am dependent solely upon Jesus Christ. I'm dependent solely upon the leadership of the Holy Spirit uh, in my life. Uh, for my spiritual needs. And, and so that's what I mean by the church uh, welfare program. But one of the no next problems I want to talk about, and one of the things that causes it, uh, I believe, is fear. And, uh, and that is fear of allowing God to have control. And I'll explain that here in just a moment. But uh, let's think about last night I was sitting, or yesterday afternoon rather, I was sitting and kind of taking my notes, thinking about the sermon today. And I uh, thought about fear as, as far as a definition for this message, uh, what is the cause of fear? Now, again, this is my definition. This is not Webster's de definition or anything like that. So, uh, but fear is a lack of understanding of who God is. And because of our lack of understanding of who God is, it causes a lack of faith in our life in what he is capable of doing. And uh, so uh, let, me, let me think about it. Let's think about it like this. A lack of understanding of who God, who is God? He is the creator of all things. And if I truly understand and believe that, what can he not do? Can anybody, listen, there's nothing God can't do. He is capable of all things, amen? And if he is the creator of the universe and he is the creator of all things, and I understand that about God, that ought to help me with my fear problem. Because when I begin to believe and to know and to believe that about God, then I begin to believe that whatever God asks me to do, that he is capable 
of giving me the, the power, the grace, the ability to be able uh, to do that thing, no matter what it is. And uh, when I do not understand this about God, then I, I limit him in his power and ability. And, and I'm just using the creation as one example. But, uh, you know, let's, let's look at this. When I begin to understand who his son Jesus is, and I begin to understand what he did for me, how much he loves me. If Je Let me ask you this. If Jesus loved me enough to go to the cross, to, let's back up further than that. If Jesus loved me enough to come to this earth and be made human flesh like me, then go to the cross and die a grueling death, a horrible death, and, and to suffer for somebody who did not deserve it, myself and yourself, if Jesus was willing to do that, what will he not do for me? Listen, I, I think that people uh, have this misunderstanding of who Jesus is. They don't understand how much Jesus loves them. And because they don't understand how much Jesus loves them, they don't really believe uh, that Jesus is with them and cares about their everyday life. How many of y'all understand that Jesus cares about everything that's going on in your life today? Everything. The good, the bad, the, 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 the mistakes, the weaknesses, the failures, all that. Listen, Jesus cares about everything. He cares about your your job situation. He cares about your family situation. He cares about your decision making. He cares about it down to the very smallest detail of your life. How many of y'all believe that this morning? Say amen. amen. Listen, when I and we be careful what you amen. Because if you really believe that, then it ought to cause me to have some real courage. Because Jesus cares about everything that's going on in my life. He cared so much that he died for me. He cared so much that he suffered for me. He cared so much that he took my place. And if he was willing to do that, what will he not do for my good? Now, does that mean that Jesus is going to give me everything I want? Does that mean he's going to, he's going to make me, you know, wealthy and things like that? If it's for my good, but I'm just telling you this... Jesus knows what is for my good, and I am just telling you that he cares for me, and he wants the best for me, okay? But don't buy into this deal that if I do the right things, and I give the right amount of money in the offering plate, and I do all this stuff, that all of a sudden now I'm going to get all this reward from God, and, and that prosperity stuff. Listen, that's, that's not true. Don't believe that kind of false doctrine. I want you to understand something, though, that Jesus does care about your life, and he will, uh, he is good, amen? And uh, he wants the best for your life. And so uh, I just, you know, if God asks you to do something, I guess when it boils down to this, when God asks you to do something, does Jesus care enough about you uh, to help you to do it? I say yes, uh, he does. And uh, so how does that, and so uh, fear is a lack of understanding of who God is, which causes a lack of faith in what he is able to, to do So how does that affect our church and our families? How does that affect our life? Uh, and here's the answer to that. Number one, we, are, we become afraid to submit to God and to abide in his victory. In other words, the Bible tells us to submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Amen? And uh, it, it talks about submission, to submit under God and, and to allow Him to be God in our life and to have complete, full control uh, of our lives. And so it causes us to be afraid to submit to God and to abide. I like that word, abide. Uh, to abide in something is to live in the midst of it, to, to be in the middle of it. And uh, to abide, to stay, to rest, not only to live in it, but to rest in it, uh, to abide in his victory. If you would turn your Bibles with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at the passage of Scripture there that goes along with that. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 in verse 14 through 16. It's a tremendous passage of Scripture of which Paul says about the thought that I'm going to read to you here. He says, I, I'm not sufficient for it. 
It's too great a thought for me. It's, it's so wonderful and so powerful. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. In other words, we always win in Jesus. Isn't that what it's saying? To triumph is to overcome. And he always causes us to overcome in Christ. Always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest or makes known the savor, the smell, the sweet smell of his knowledge by us in every place. In other words, uh, wherever you go as a Christian, Jesus uh, triumphing in your life, you're living in the triumph of Jesus Christ, then everyone around you is going to recognize it. They're going to see it. They're going to, they're, they're in a sense, they're going to smell it, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. Uh, they're they're going to know that you're a Christian. Amen. Man, I'm going to tell you something about our life as Christians. We should not be able to be around lost people or any people for that matter, as the scripture goes on and explains here. We should not be around any people for very long before they know that Christ is Savior of our life. They know there's something different about us. And uh, so to live in the triumph that is in Christ is to make everybody know that Jesus is Lord of your life. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death and to death and to the other the savor of life and the life. And who is sufficient for these things? So uh, let, me, let me back up. And I know I've explained this scripture before, but I want to, I just real, wanna, real quickly, for those of you that don't know, understand what Paul is referring to. He's referring to a Roman triumphal entry. In other words, a general uh, would go into a foreign land in the empire of Rome, and he would conquer that land, and he would bring captives and the spoils of war uh, back to Rome with him. And there was certain requirements and things that had to be made for a, a triumphal parade or entry to take place. And uh, so anyway, this general, he goes and he conquers these people. He brings back with him uh, the captives. Now, in, he was in a chariot. He would have been in a chariot. And before his chariot would have been a group of people, captives. And behind his chariot, he would have had people following him. They're all tied together. They're all chained up. And he's leading a group, and he's pulling behind him a group. The group that, he, uh, that, that was in front of him uh, were the group of people who were going to be set free, and they would become Roman citizens. Uh, the group that was behind him would be executed. Now then, the reason that Paul uses that for an example is, is, is he wants to draw a picture for us of those who do not believe in Christ, but yet Christ triumphs over them. He gives us a picture of those who are become believers in Christ, that Christ is leading them. You say, well, they're in front of the chariot, they're leading him. No, he's driving them. Okay, he's driving them forward and I'm going to get that here in just a minute. But either way, whether you believe or whether you do not believe, he is still Christ. He is still Lord. Amen. And he is triumphant over the lost and he is triumphant over the saved. Either way, he is king. Amen. Either way, he has won the victory. And uh, that's the picture that Paul gives us. But I want us to focus on the people uh, who were in front of his chariot. He is Lord. He is driving them. He is, he is guiding them in the direction that he wants them to go. And that's the way it ought to be for us that are Christians. We are living in his victory. He is now Lord of our life. And he is driving us forward into the world. Forward into victory. Forward into success in Christian living. Amen? How many of y'all believe that you can live a successful Christian life? Man, so many of us are living, though, in defeat. We don't need to live in defeat. Jesus has won the victory. He is Lord, and he is driving our lives forward, and we can uh, abide in his victory, and we can experience victory as a result of that. There is no reason as to why we should live as Christians in defeat uh, because we are living in the victory that is Christ. And when I understand that about Jesus, that I am living in his victory, man, that gives me liberty. That gives me freedom. That gives me the freedom from fear. Because now he is Lord, he is in control, 
Jesus, whatever you're asking me to do, I'll do it because you're going to take care of it and it's going to be okay. Amen? And you see, that's how fear can dissipate uh, in a person's life. And uh, I want to, uh, let's move forward. So uh, the next thing I want to want you to think about is, is what does fear cause a church to become? And I've seen this in my own life. I've seen it in different churches I pastored. I, I mean, I think it's a, a pretty universal thought. Uh, but church can become a self-serving organization because we do not believe that God is able to direct its course. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, let me say this. When we do not believe that God is able to direct a church's course, then what happens is, is that we want to be in charge. We want to be in control. We want to call the shots because I don't really believe God has the ability to do it without me. And I'm afraid to allow him to do that. I'm afraid to allow him to be God and for him to lead us in the direction that he wants us to go. Uh, therefore, I have to say, well, I don't think it's that way. I think it needs to be this way. And I start interjecting my emotions, my thoughts, my heart uh, into it instead of allowing God to be uh, in charge. And so church can become a self-serving organization. Remember last week I talked about self-will. Uh, and disobedience as to being a problem. And uh, part of that comes from fear. We don't obey because we're afraid to obey. We're not certain about that. We're not certain about how God is leading us. We're not certain about what God wants. Uh, and that, that fear causes disobedience. And uh, so we might say this, and I had this, I, I thought about this yesterday. Some people, including myself, sometimes might say, well, I don't know. You know, I think God maybe is able, but I'm not so sure about those people that I go to church with. Uh, I'm not so sure God can handle them. And uh, I remember uh, listening, and some of y'all have heard the message by uh, Otto Koenig, uh, who was a missionary down in Papua New Guinea years ago. Uh, he's dead now, but uh, anyway, he, uh, he was a missionary years ago down in Papua New Guinea. I love to watch some of his old videos uh, where he come back to the States and talked about his experiences there. But one of his experiences there, uh, he was having such trouble with the native people, and he was also having such trouble overcoming his own will he was having such trouble overcoming his own fear. Uh, he was having such trouble overcoming his own uh, desire to have his rights met uh, that was causing all kinds of trouble in his ministry in Papua New Guinea. And when he learned to submit to God, all that went away, and he was able to be successful. And uh, so uh, one of the things he said, though, he said, you know, I, I could have been a great missionary if it wasn't for those people. I thought, man, it's true. I've thought that before. Man, if it wasn't for the people, I'd be a great preacher. If it wasn't for those people. You could be a great uh, lay person if it wasn't for those other people, right? Uh, and we might, you might say, well, I could be a great church member if it wasn't for that preacher. Uh, we, I mean, just listen, you take everything else out of the equation, you'd be just right where you need to be. And that's the way we think sometimes. And uh, so one of the things that uh, causes fear is I think we worry uh, about, you know, the people that are around us. We even worry about that maybe where we work. Maybe we worry about that in our family. I could be a great husband if it wasn't for my wife. I could be a great wife if it wasn't for my husband. So on and so forth. I'd be a great parent if I didn't have any kids. I could tell everybody else how easy it is, right? That's the way we think sometimes. And so we have fear of people. You know, but, you know what the Bible says about the fear of man? Does anybody know? It's a, snare. It's, a tra it's a trap. It's a snare. Okay, so the fear of man is a snare. It'll keep you from doing what you need to do. And uh, so, uh, but I want you to understand something about all of us. And I know that, that all of us know this about everybody else, but do we know this about ourselves? God is not looking for perfect people that will do perfect things. He's looking for flawed people who will obey Him, who will love Him, who will submit to Him. Listen, I am flawed. You are flawed. No matter what, listen, God calls me to do something. I may make a mistake in doing it, but with my heart is in it, my heart is following God. Listen, I am telling you now, 
And I'm not trying to make excuses for, for making mistakes, but I am telling you, you will make mistakes. I will make mistakes. You will make mistakes. And God is bigger than my mistakes, my failures, and my weaknesses. Amen? I am so glad for that. Because if he was limited to those things in my life, then he is extremely limited. So God is not looking for us to be perfect in that sense. He is looking for us to be obedient. And he is looking for us to serve him with all of our heart. The Bible says in the book of Romans 8.28, you don't have to turn there, but you can write it down. Most of us know the scripture. Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And I want you to understand some, all things, even our weaknesses, even our failures, even our, even our mistakes, work together for good to those that love the Lord. I love him, but yet I'm going to make mistakes. And I am telling you, he can take my mistakes and turn them to good. Amen? Amen. It's true. Okay, so don't, man, don't forget that. And remember that about each other. Remember that about one another. That we're all flawed and God wants us just to learn to be obedient. And uh, so not everything, I want you to know that not everything went perfect for Gideon. When Gideon went out to defeat the Midianites and was obeying God and doing everything that God asked him to do, when he went out there, uh, he, he per, you know, the, the battle went their way, of course, and they were pursuing the Midianites. They were chasing after them. And as they chased, this went on for hours and hours, you know. I mean, this is, this is a long battle. And they came to a place called Succoth. And this place, you know, these people, it was a, a, a you know, a village or, or a, a territory. And, and they came to this place and, and they, they had become very hungry in their pursuit. They were wore out and they were hungry. And they asked the people to suck it. They said, listen, we need bread. We want you to give us some bread. We're in pursuit of these Midianites. And those people told them, they said, hey, get lost. We're not going to help you. We don't want nothing to do with it. And so they left there and, and they went on and they come to a place called Penuel. And they asked those people, hey, we are, we are hungry, we're in pursuit, we need some food to keep us strong, we're pursuing these people, uh, these Midianites, and they told them the same thing, hey, we're not going to help you, we don't want nothing to do with your cause, just go on about your way. Listen, not everything went perfect for Gideon. You say, well, that wasn't Gideon's fault. I understand that, but I'm just here to tell you something. If you're going to live and work and serve God, I promise you there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be problems. There's going to be mistakes. People sometimes are going to get in the way, and, and I'm just telling you, God is bigger than them. Amen? God is bigger than your problems. God is bigger than all the stuff that you face. He will make a way around it. And they went on and pursued and followed after what God told them to do. And they won an awesome victory. They killed 120,000 Midianites at least. And I looked that up, Sean, after you showed me that passage of Scripture. You're right, I think. I couldn't figure out how many people, at least 135,000 Midianites. 120,000 of them were killed. Listen, it was a decisive, massive victory uh, that the children of Israel won. And it started out with 300 obedient people. Okay? Now then, so why is it so important that these men not be afraid? Why would God send 22,000 of them home? There's only 32,000 of them to begin with. Now, he is going to narrow that on down to 300. But why would he send 22,000 that were afraid home? And I want to talk about that just for a moment. Number one, because God is going to ask them to do some extraordinary things. I think last week I might have used the word ridiculous things. Uh, that this was going to seem absolutely ludicrous. It was going to be ridiculous what God was going to ask them to do. There's at least 135,000 Midianites. There's, there's only here 32,000 of them. Why would you not be afraid? I mean, the odds of this battle going your way are just, they, it just zero. I mean, it's not going to work. And 22,000 of them were afraid to go into battle. And why was it so important for them not to be afraid? 
Again, God was going to ask them to do some re- extraordinary things that would require them to believe in his abilities. I mean, if you weren't afraid, you were going to have to believe God's going to do what he says he's going to do, right? That it would require them to believe in his abilities, and it would also require them to believe in Gideon's calling of leadership to take them into battle. It was going to require that. I'm going to explain that a little bit deeper here in just a moment. But it's going to require them to believe in, in God's abilities, and it's going to require them to believe that Gideon was God's man to lead them into it. And it could no longer be about them, but it had to be about God. Because if this battle was about them, they would be afraid. They're going to have to put their selves, their own fears, their own concerns, their own disbeliefs, they're going to have to put that behind them. And they're just going to have to focus on God. And they're going to say, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to, I'm going to win a victory with you. I want you to think about something real quickly. Uh, 22,000 of them went home. How do you think they felt when they heard about this awesome victory that Gideon and his men, they're now heroes in Israel. How do you think they felt when, they, when it came to them, I could have been part of that, but I was too afraid. Listen, I am telling you, God can take this church, he can take your life, he can take your family, and he can do awesome things with it. If you'll just trust him, obey him, follow him with all of your heart, Don't look back on your life one day and say, man, I wonder what I could have been. I wonder what could have been. Those who are afraid, why is it important for them not to be afraid? Last thing. Those that were afraid would have, there would have been some bad qualities, there would have been some bad things that would have took place had they went into the battle. I think it is a picture of the modern church as well. And what fear, not only our church, but our families and so on and so forth, is a picture of what can happen when we are afraid to trust God. Those who were afraid would have constantly questioned and second-guessed what they were doing. They would have constantly been saying, you know what, uh, Gideon, I don't think you really know what you're talking about. I don't think you know what you're doing. I, I'm scared. And, and Gideon, that, you want us to do What? That doesn't make any sense. This is the way I think it needs to be done. This, this is stupid. This is crazy. And that's what it would have caused. It would have caused the people to constantly have questioned and second-guessed, which would have led to fear and doubt and discouragement among the confident. How many of y'all know that discouragement is contagious? How, how, how many of y'all know that discouragement, I feel like, is more contagious than confidence? How many of y'all have ever started out a day with great confidence and joy, but you got around somebody that was a drag, and before the end of the day, you're just down on their level? Y'all ever experienced that? I'm in a great mood, but... My, my, you know, my husband was in a terrible mood, therefore the whole day is just shot. And it might be the same way at work. Uh, you know, people at, at work can be so discouraging. And, and uh, when you're working in the factory, you get one person just griping, complaining about, oh man, the lead guy, the boss, the supervisor, the, the people that own this place, they don't care about anybody. I mean, they're just, man, they, just, they don't know what they're doing. And it's just all, you know, and on and on. And before you know it, they've got the whole line discouraged. And productivity falls as a result of it. I've seen that happen. And that's what would have happened to the children of Israel. Those that were afraid, would have, their fear, their doubts, their discouragement would have spread among the confident. And then last of all, they would have been regularly, and I've already kind of alluded to this in the first thing, but they would have been regularly offended. And fear often comes out of anger. It comes out in anger. How many of y'all know that people that are afraid when, when they can get pretty defensive? I know I can. If I'm afraid about doing something, I can get pretty defensive about, about it. And it can come out in anger. And a lot of times that's what happens in our families, in our churches, in our everyday life. 
Uncle Terry, before he left this morning, I was trying to think yesterday. I thought, do I know of any circumstances where I can give an example of this being true? Uncle Terry told me after the first service this morning, he said, you know, that reminds me, so I want you to know that's exactly right, what you said, that the, the fear spreads. And because you all know that he served in Vietnam and seen some pretty, pretty rough stuff over there in the last, you know, the last real uh, battle or firefight that he was in. Some of his friends were killed in that. And he said there was one guy uh, that was killed. And when those guys, they were all pretty close knit. And when they, another guy seen him get killed, he jumped up screaming, he said, and, and, and started to run, shot in the back, killed. As a result of it, he says, contagious. Fear is contagious. And I, I thought that's a good example. Because that'll get us in trouble every time. That's why these people needed to have courage. That's why we need to have courage. We need to have courage to be the leaders. Us men need to have courage to be the leaders in our homes. And I, I want to say this. I thought yesterday about this, and I'm going to talk about this in another message later on. But You know, the Bible talks about Christ being the head of the man and the man being the head of the home. But I want to ask you men something this morning. You ought to have courage to lead your home. And you women ought to have courage to follow your husband. But I want to put most of the, 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 the responsibility upon you men this morning. Are you the kind of men, are you the kind of man that is worthy to be followed courageously? You understand what I'm saying? Are you the kind of man that your wife can wake up in the morning and say, you know, I'm confident that he is going to lead me in the right direction? Are you the kind of man that your children can wake up in the morning and say, I'm confident that dad's going to lead me in the right direction? That he's going to lead me closer to God? That he's going to lead our family? He's going to, he's going to be the man that God's called him to be? I wonder if I'm that kind of man. Something to think about. You see, fear will cause us to be cowards. Fear will cause us to lay down our responsibilities. Fear will cause us to not step up and be the people, men, women, whatever, that we're called to be. Amen? Fear. Listen, don't be afraid. Have confidence in who God is. Have confidence in how much Jesus loves you. If you would, let's stand this morning, please. I'm going to ask Julie to please come to the piano again this morning. Once you know these altars are open, if you want to use them. But I want you to bow your heads with me. Close your eyes, and we'll be looking around just for a moment. Julie, if you go ahead and begin to play. I ask you this morning, do you have enough faith? Do you have enough courage to allow God to have control of your life? Everything in your life, all of it. Do you have enough courage to allow God to have control of your family? Do you have enough courage to allow God to have control of our church? Listen, I want you to know something. It is My life is not my own. If you don't know that, the Bible says that I have been bought with a price. I have been bought by the blood of Jesus. I belong to Him. And what He buys, I promise you He will not neglect. What He buys, I promise you He will take the utmost care of it. And I trust Him for that. And I hope you trust Him for that. If you know Him as your Savior, if you do not know Jesus this morning, will you have the courage to say, Jesus, I want to allow you to be my Savior. And you can do that this morning, and I invite you to do that. I invite you to say, Jesus, 
I receive you into my life. I receive your sacrifice. I receive your resurrection. I receive your forgiveness into my life for my salvation. And if you're already saved here this morning, will you say, Jesus, I want to submit my whole life under your mighty hand and your direction. That's what he wants from us. If we'll do that, man, he can do anything with us. If you'll let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I bow before your presence today. I want to thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to learn from your word, to take and share, Lord, the powerful truth that is contained in the word of God. I thank you, Jesus, for who you are. I thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. And I put my full faith and trust in it. And I ask you in the name of Jesus that the power of God would move in these people's lives. That we would become submissive. That we would submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God. That we would become the army of God that you have called us to be. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, when these people leave here today, that God, that, that Lord, we will take courage in our homes, that we'll take courage in our walk with you on a daily basis, that we will allow you to be God, that you will, we will allow you to be Lord in our life, and that we will follow you in obedience, and Lord, in thanksgiving. And we'll give you the praise and the honor in the name of Jesus. And Father, I want to ask you, before we dismiss this morning, that if there's anybody here that is without Christ, that right now that they would just acknowledge your death, your resurrection, and accept your sacrifice into their life for the forgiveness of their sins. And we'll give you the praise and the thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.